Welcome, everyone. We would like to acknowledge the following special guests joining us tonight, both in person and online. The Honourable, Gab the Honourable Gabrielle Upton MP, Member for Vaucluse, representing the Premier. Mr Dave Sharma MP, Member for Wentworth, representing the Prime Minister. Mr Ron Honig MP, Member for Heffron, representing the Leader of the Opposition, Jody Mackay MP. The Honourable Dr Jeff Lee MP, Member for Parramatta, Minister for Skills and Tertiary Education and Minister for Sport, Multiculturalism, Seniors and Veterans. The Honourable Jonathan O'Day MP, Member for Davidson and Speaker of the New South Wales Legislative Assembly. The Reverend the Honourable Fred Nile MLC. Dr Marjorie, <coughs> Marjorie O'Neill MP, Member for Coogee. Consuls General from Malta, Republic of Turkey, Federal Republic of Germany, Ireland, El Salvador, New Zealand, Ukraine, Canada, Greece and Israel. Councillors from City of Sydney Council, Lane Cove Council, Randwick Council, Waverley Council and Wallara Council. Our partner, our partner organisations, the JCA, the Australian Association of Jewish Holocaust Survivors and Descendants, COA, Courage to Care, Kangaruski, the Sydney Jewish Museum and Youth Here, and our dear Holocaust survivors. This evening, we gather on the lands of the Gadigal of the Eora Nation of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people. We pay our respects to the traditional owners and their elders past and present. Australia has provided a home for our Jewish community and we recognise the mutual understanding between our community and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in relation to historical trauma, spirituality and relationship to land. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight, online and here in the auditorium. For the first time, we are holding our Yom HaShoah commemoration in a hybrid format. Each year, the number of Holocaust survivors sadly diminishes. But the importance of remembering them and their stories does not. It becomes the responsibility of each new generation to know and share the testimonies of the horrors experienced by the survivors who are with us today. 2021 marks 80 years since the Nazi murder of over 1 million Jews in Soviet territory, many by the Einsatzgruppen units sent there for that specific purpose. Dr. Arkady Zeltzer, director of the Moshe Mirilashvili Center for Research on the Holocaust in the Soviet Union, Union at Yad Vashem, says that to fully grasp the Holocaust and its impact, one must go beyond Auschwitz and the Warsaw Ghetto and learn about the events of the Holocaust in areas like the occupied Soviet Union. For many years, the Holocaust was symbolized by two places, Auschwitz and the Warsaw Ghetto, he said. These are commonly perceived as the primary symbols, but that's not the entire story of the Holocaust. While the, the, while the story of the Holocaust in the Soviet Union may be, may be less well known in our community, it is just as crucial to remember. Tonight, we bring some of this story to the community. Thank you. Good evening. Before introducing tonight's keynote speaker, I'd like to thank the members of my committee and to particularly acknowledge our show members, remembrance manager, Suzanne Green, who has done a tremendous job managing tonight's commemoration. This year, we selected the Holocaust in the Soviet Union as the theme for the Yom HaShoah commemorations. As you heard from Leslie, 2021 marks 80 years since Nazi Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union where the Nazis and their willing collaborators murdered over, over one million Jews, approximately one and a half million Jews. One quarter of all Jews murdered in the Holocaust were from the Soviet Union. Tonight is an opportunity for these victims and the survivors to have their stories told. 
I am honoured to introduce a true leader of our community, Alex Rifgin, who will give tonight's keynote speech on the Holocaust in the Soviet Union. Alex is co-CEO of the Executive Council of Australian Jewry. He is the author of three books, including a critically acclaimed history of Zionism and a children's book, A New Day, which was selected as PBS's top children's book for the pandemic. Alex was born in Kiev, Ukraine, then part of the Soviet Union, and arrived in Sydney with his family as refugees and refuseniks in 1988. Alex studied law and politics at UNSW before practicing law at major firms in Sydney and London. Prior to joining the ECAJ in 2013, he served as a spokesperson for the Zionist Federation UK and as a staff writer and research fellow for a Jerusalem-based think tank. Alex's writing on Israel, Jewish history and politics regularly appears in major publications. He is a frequent commentator on TV, radio and podcasts, has participa participated in televised debates and has delivered speeches in parliaments, major conferences and universities around the world. Please welcome Alex Rifgin. Thank you very much. I'm humbled and honored to give the keynote address at this, the most important annual event for our Sydney Jewish community. First of all, I'd like to thank and acknowledge the president of the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies, Leslie Berger, and also Kirsty, and the entire Berger family for all they have done for our community. As the descendant of a Holocaust survivor, Leslie knows well the duty on all of us to honor the millions of lives lost and to record their stories. And I want to thank Leslie for his leadership in this undertaking, also to acknowledge the honorary officers, the directors, the life members of the Board of Deputies. I want to thank and commend the Chair of the Holocaust Remembrance Committee, Dane Stern, also Suzanne Green and all of the committee members for the devotion and energy they brought to this event. I'd like to acknowledge the many community leaders present this evening, including Gillian Siegel, AO, the President of the Executive Council of the Australian Jury, to welcome John Roth as well, Peter Wertheim, AM, and Robert Good, AOSC. I'd like to welcome the many members of the federal and state parliaments, councillors, ambassadors, and consuls with us this evening and watching online throughout the country. And finally, but foremost, I wish to acknowledge the survivors of the Holocaust, the most esteemed and treasured members of our community, those who emerged from the greatest crime in history and enlighten our society with their dignity and their strength. What happened to the Jews of the Soviet Union during the Second World War is one of the least understood aspects of the history of the Holocaust. The crimes committed there were too vast, too swift, too brutal, too complete. They left few survivors to tell the story. They left no large camps or crematoria, edifices of human monstrosity that served to remind and to educate. For the most part, the very few who survived these crimes, the very many who committed them, and the Soviet authorities that failed to prevent them, were all satisfied to try to erase them from consciousness. But all throughout the once unknowable lands of the former Soviet territories lie killing fields, thousands of sites, many of them disturbed and desecrated in city parks and forests and gentle valleys where entire communities of murdered Jews lie beneath. The extermination of the Soviet Jews took place under cover of the German invasion of the Soviet Union launched on the 22nd of June, 1941. Stalin had been caught completely unprepared, having long dismissed Churchill's warnings of ominous German troop movements and intelligence reports of a looming invasion as mere British agitation and warmongering. Stalin's purges in the 1930s of his finest generals and imprisonment of millions of Soviet citizens in the Siberian gulags had left the Red Army a pitiful husk utterly incapable of defending its territory against the advance of the regular German army, the Wehrmacht. The invasion was the single largest military operation ever seen, involving some 3.8 million German and Axis troops. Within three weeks of its commencement, the Germans had captured territory twice the size of France. Within a month, the Soviets had lost two million men and seen the destruction of much of its officer corps. But this was an entirely different kind of war, one unprecedented in human history. Here the primary aim was not territorial acquisition or a strategic victory, but the complete obliteration of the enemies of Nazism and what Hitler termed Judeo-Bolshevik influence. 
He promised this would be a battle of annihilation, a Rassenkampf, race war. In the months leading up to the invasion, the German High Command had to solve the problem of how to simultaneously conduct a conventional military campaign on an enormous scale requiring maximum force delivered with lightning speed while diverting men and resources for something which had no military imperative whatsoever, the pursuit and destruction of civilian communities in towns and cities and villages across thousands of miles of Soviet territory. By March 1941, it had been determined that special task forces would be deployed to implement collective measures against the Jews. They would receive their quarters and supplies from the German army, but they would pursue their own mission, taking their orders from the chief of security police, Reinhard Heydrich. As the German army swallowed up enormous territory, bringing millions of Soviet citizens under its control, these special task forces moved fast on their heels, often even appearing on the front lines to trap the Jews before they could discover their fate. In Zhitomir, they entered right behind the first German tanks. In Kiev, they entered on the same day that the city fell. Elite, mobile, and merciless, these special task forces, these killing squads, were known as Einsatzgruppen. The entire Einsatzgruppen consisted of a mere 3,000 men, broken into four divisions, Einsatzgruppe A, B, C, and D. Each was attached to another group of the advancing German army, meaning they could fan out and cover enormous territory, from Edessa on the Black Sea in the south, to Tallinn and Riga on the Baltic in the north. Their effectiveness came from their mobility, their freedom to peel off from the regular army, enter towns and villages to begin their hunt. After striking at a target, they would return to conduct further sweeps. Sometimes mere hours after the first, sometimes weeks would pass, but they would always return to ensnare any Jews who had evaded the initial dragnet. The precise methods of killing varied. In Dalnik, outside Odessa, Jews were crammed in warehouses and machine gunned through holes in the walls and then set alight. In Zmievska Balka, outside Rostov, the Jewish men were led to a ravine and shot. The women, the children, the elderly were gassed in trucks and then deposited in the ravine. Jews were shot in forest pits they were forced to dig, in anti-tank trenches in which they were forced to lie, layer upon layer upon layer, the living lying atop the dead and wounded, awaiting the fire of the bullets from above. Sometimes the Germans would simply bury Jews alive to spare their bullets. The locals would report strange movements of the earth and groans from within for days after these massacres. On other occasions, the Germans would incite locals to club Jews to death or to burn them alive. In Bogdanovka, Jews were placed in stables, 5,000 sick and infirm Jews, which were then sprinkled with straw and set alight. 43,000 more were marched into the forest in groups of 300, forced to kneel naked in the ice and shot. The sheer speed of events, the lightning German advance, had left the Jews in a bewildered daze. Sometimes in the span of just a few hours, the Soviet forces would abandon a town or a city, the killing squads would enter, and the Jews would simply be plucked from an ordinary peaceful civilian existence and taken to be executed despite having committed no crime. The Germans frequently noted a strange calmness among the Jews as they drifted in a dreamlike disbelief right up until the moment of death. Their already meager capacity to resist overwhelming force neutralized by the deathly efficiency of the killers. In places like Riga, Vilnius, and Slonim, ghettos were established so that those Jews deemed too valuable for the initial massacres, skilled Jewish workers, could be used as slave laborers until non-Jewish replacements could be trained. When it came time to liquidate a ghetto, a few Jews would be taken to dig mass graves outside the town in readiness for the slaughter. Now knowing what fate awaited them in the morning, a morbid communal dread set in, and the Jews would make final, feeble, futile appeals to the Germans. The killing operations would begin either at dawn or sometimes in the middle of the night. First, police units would encircle the ghetto, then SS men and local collaborators would enter with flashlights, shouting for the Jews to open their doors. Those who submitted were assembled and led to the mass graves to be shot. Those who resisted or hid were burned alive or exploded with grenades. The sheer scale of this killing was enormous. Every day, the Einsatzgruppen would dutifully send reports to Central Command of 23,600 Jews shot in Kamenets Podolsk, of 33,771 Jews shot in Kiev, of 35,000 in Nikolaev, and on it went day after day after day. But so small a force with no knowledge of the land or the population could not have killed on such a scale without considerable help. And in virtually every place it entered, these killing squads could count on the support of locals, 
who knew the Jews and knew the hiding places. In the Ukraine, Latvia and Lithuania, they formed auxiliary police units which assisted in every phase of the killing process, often carrying out the bloodiest work to spare the nerves of the Germans. The Romanian troops around Odessa frequently shocked the Germans with their brutality and their sadism, butchering Jews independently of Nazi orders. Ordinary civilians also seized the opportunity to plunder, brutalize, and murder their Jewish neighbors. In Kaunas, a young Lithuanian man bludgeoned Jews to death with a crowbar in front of a crowd that sung the national anthem and cheered every killing. In Latvia, university students assisted in the killing of Jews. In Proskurev, Ukraine, the Ukrainians lined the streets and applauded as Jewish women were stripped and led to be shot. By the time the Nazis, were, the Germans were forced into a retreat, some 1.5 million Jews lay dead across Soviet lands. 90% of Lithuanian Jews were dead. In Latvia, just a few hundred Jews remained. Estonia had been declared completely free of Jews as early as 1942. In Belarus, 800,000 Jews were dead. The one-storied black soil of the Ukraine now bulged disfigured from over 2,000 killing sites across its land. Babi Yar, a block from my own family's home, just one site, the most famous. But every town, every city, every village hosted its own Babi Yar, its own killing field. One of the reasons why the Soviet phase of the Holocaust is so often overlooked is that it fails to fit within many of the prevailing theories to emerge from the study of the Holocaust. That there was a phased, discernible progression from Nuremberg to Kristallnacht to the adoption of the final solution in Wannsee in January 1942. That there was a gradual process of dehumanization of evil words that led to evil deeds. That the insidious drip of Nazi propaganda slowly turned populations against their Jews, making them numb or complicit to their demise. But the extermination of the Jews had been operating in the Soviet territories for six months before Vanzi. In the Soviet Union, there was no careful process of defining and classifying Jews, of gradually expunging them from public life by confining them to ghettos until we resembled the insular, wretched, disease species the propaganda said we were all along, and the locals now ached for our removal. In the Soviet Union, none of this was necessary. The locals had been primed into supporting anti-Jewish measures over centuries. By the Cossacks of Bogdan Khmelnytsky, by the conspiracy theories spread by the Tsar's secret police, by the church and by state-sanctioned pogroms. In the Soviet Union, the Jews could simply be summoned and shot with no opposition and no outcry. Who were the assassins of children and old women on the Eastern Front? Who were the men who filled the ranks of the Einsatzgruppen, who rode down dirt tracks and highways on motorbikes and in cars, like merry adventurers entering new towns and villages, where they would attend to the shooting of 875 women and girls in Berdachev, or where they would kill 90 Jewish children in Belitserkva, that acted not only with a deathly precision, but a clear enthusiasm. In Minsk, they forced children into pits of quicksand and threw handfuls of sweets at them as they flailed in terror and perished. These were not young soldiers trained to kill on command or depraved criminals released from German jails and now let loose. Virtually all were educated men in their 30s and 40s. One of the earliest commanders of the Einsatzgruppen held a doctorate in jurisprudence. One of their officers was a physician. Many were lawyers. One was an opera singer. These were cultured men, deep thinkers, who plainly knew the insanity of killing every single Jew as a Bolshevik agitator. They knew, and yet they carried out their work with a perfect efficiency, applied all of their talent and learning to it, and never wavered in their task. And so gone were entire communities, whole dynasties of sages and scholars and artists. Gone were the secluded families seeking wisdom in ancient texts. Gone were the middle-class merchants of the cities, the Jewish peasants tending the land, the poets, the bankers, the doctors, the vagrants, the drunks, the children, the old and the sick, all of them, all shot as mortal threats to German survival and human progress. In the final wash, it just didn't matter how absurd the idea of their collective guilt was. People believed this insanity because they wanted to believe it. And if they were wrong, and they had just extinguished millions of lives for no reason at all, and their misfortune would not go to the grave with a Jew, well, at least they'd blown off a little steam and enriched themselves in the process. The thousands of stories of trauma and suffering the dozens of dispassionate historical texts, the Hollywood films, the memoirs, and novellas that depict these events, all seek and all fail to explain why human beings would behave this way to their fellow man. What discord exists in the hearts of ordinary men and women? 
that they would seize with unrelenting purpose the opportunity to dispossess, humiliate, and murder their neighbors simply because they were Jewish. This is the imponderable at the heart of the Holocaust. There is a story told by the scholar and Nazi hunter Ephraim Zurov at the beginning of one of his books. He tells of Shimon Dubnov, who was a great writer and historian, and he was one of those Jews shot in the Riga ghetto. And as he was being led to be killed, he cried out his final instructions to those Jews around him. He said, Yidin, Farshrebet, Jews, write it all down, record everything. Meanwhile, in Kovno, Lithuania, Jews there wrenched from their homes and taken to be shot, left their final instructions, which they'd scrawled on one of the walls. It said, Yidin, Nakoima, Jews, take revenge. I think about these words a lot, and I'm compelled in part to write and to speak about what happened to our people by the injunction of Shimon Dubnov, as painful as this history is to read and to write and to speak. But the revenge, a concept to which I'm particularly drawn, is more elusive. How does one avenge the most audacious, the largest, the most barbaric crime in human history? Really a sequence of millions upon millions of crimes rendered on the weak and defenseless by hundreds of thousands of individual perpetrators who for the most part face no justice or consequences at all. But when I think about what those crimes sought to achieve, which was the complete termination of Jewish life so that we and our children should never have been born, by living, by living as Jews, by bringing new Jewish life into this world, have we not taken our revenge? When the killers were forced into a retreat, they sought to erase any memory or evidence of their crimes to deny that our people ever lived or died by hastily exhuming and burning the bodies. But we know, and we gather to educate and to remember, we dedicate new museums, we erect new monuments to our sacred dead even right here in this great city. Have we not taken our revenge? And we should go on avenging daily through our survival, through our pride and our strength, and that will be our victory. Thank you very much. I was born in Poland, in Warsaw, in fact, in one of the streets that subsequently became the Warsaw Ghetto. My families are of two different strains of Judaism. My mum was an Ashkenazi and my father was a Safari. And we had a very large presence in Poland going back on my father's side to the Spanish Inquisition. In 1935, soon after the Nuremberg laws that were imposed on Jewish people, my father thinks that being in Bialystok is much more conducive to, to stay away from the Nazis. So he travels to Bialystok soon after my birth to see whether he can start a business in Bialystok. This is where the war catches him. So he sends a messenger with a note to my mum, asking her to leave Warsaw and bring the children to Bialystok. She gets to the border and organizes a river crossing and she had to make sure that I don't cry. And what she did was kept chocolate to my mouth, which secured my silence. And we crossed the river uneventfully, only to be stopped by a young Russian soldier pointing the gun at my mum. She gets out of the boat, plunges herself on the riverbank and refuses to take 
the order. The young man, not wanting to uh, kill a woman with a baby, she pulls out the note. The officer in charge allows her to proceed with the rest of her trip and told her to get lost. And she boards a train and she gets to the address. We became reunited as a family of four, seeing that the war will be imminent. My father puts his name down on a list as an electrician. Well, electrician, he is not. He's a handbag maker. But he lies about his profession because he knows that he will be taken out of Bialystok with his family, a place called Zlataus in Siberia. That was the town in which we found our safe haven, where we lived through the war years. A room that was five by six became the place we lived. Living in those dormitory accommodation was a challenge. I remember as a boy, hunger. I remember starving. My sister was born in 1942 in February and we became a family of five. My mom coined a name for her, the sunshine in Siberia. There was hardly any sunshine there, but the reason was the fact that we were given additional coupons, so we received more milk, butter and cheese, and there was suddenly more nutrition for the family to share. So these are the things that were part of our hardships in Siberia. We had a speaker attached to the wall, constant Soviet communist style propaganda. No news dispatches. My parents never knew what was going on in Poland or in the rest of Europe. Once the war ended, I was six and a half years of age, and we soon found out that Warsaw was in ruins. International agencies were creating those listings of survivors, and this is where we found out that not a single name from our family was on those lists. We suddenly discovered that we were the only survivors from a very long and large existence of our families living in Poland. As I was growing up, I occasionally would attach myself to another Jewish friend of my parents and I would call them uncle. That was the only way I could substitute my own family. We arrived at Wulamalu on the 26th of November of 1960 because of the Jewish Welfare Society. And within one year, we managed to save enough money to have a deposit for a home in Greenwich. And a few days later, our neighbors come across to welcome us with a plate of Anzac biscuits. When they came. I didn't think very much of that gesture. It only dawned to me much later that this was a gesture of acceptance. That became the signature, if you like, of life that we enjoyed here in Australia.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me introduce myself. My name is Eitan Nashlos. I'm the proud grandson of a woman named Tamara Zisserman, Zichona Levracha. I'm also director of the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies and chairman of Courage to Care, an organization very close to my heart and under the auspices of B'nai B'rit Australia. Why is it close to my heart? Because like many of you, my family suffered through the Holocaust. In my case, it was my grandmother, the late Tamara Zisselman. And it is because of her, I am now, decades later, leading Courage to Care to create awareness of the dangers of prejudice, racism, and discrimination. But first of all, let me tell you my grandmother's story and the intertwined tale of three incredible, brave people now honored as righteous among the nations. Tamara Kantarovich was born on December 30th, 1929 in Minsk, Belarus, which as you know, was part of the Soviet Union. In 1941, the Jewish people in Lahoysk were ordered by the Nazis to gather at the outskirts of the town and forced to dig a large mass grave. Two days later, those same Jews were summoned to the freshly dug grave. Terrified, they were forced to undress. Heartlessly, they were shot dead in cold blood. Carelessly, their bodies were thrown into the graves en masse without any prayer or emotion. Indeed, it is still, to this day, so hard to comprehend what one group of human beings could do to another. You can only imagine how frightened my grandmother, then 11 years of age, was when her mother and grandmother, on a summer holiday in Lahoysk, were rounded up with other Jews while Tamara hid. But this is where our faith in humanity is renewed. Christian locals, Janina and Pieter Kodasevich, risked their own lives and that of their three small daughters, Tanya, Maya, and Vaya, to hide a weeping and terrified Tamara in their basement. My grandmother's mother and her parents went to the assembly point, and later it became known that they along with other Jews, had been massacred. The Kodaseviches, at an incredible risk, hid Tamara and also helped the Soviet partisans. I wish I could tell you more. I wish with all my heart I could tell you how the incredibly brave Kodasevich family managed to hide my grandmother for so long. <clears throat> and how she managed to survive in a dark, dank basement. One can only imagine. But like millions of others around the world, this story is hard to tell, as telling it is reliving it. And both my late grandmother and my mother got incredibly distressed when they were pressed for details. And who can blame them? As the story does not have a happy ending. 
the Kodosevichers were eventually caught and murdered along with one of their toddler daughters for their role in the resistance. But in another incredible act of bravery and kindness, Pieter's mother, Antonia Kodosevich, gave Tamara refuge despite what had happened to her own family. Tamara's luck soon ran out. In 1944, she was arrested by the Germans and taken to the Metgethen Nazi labor camp in Kennenberg, Prussia. A year later, at just 15, she bravely escaped with a few Soviet soldiers who were also imprisoned. The war ended, and like millions of other Jewish people, Tamara's life, free of death, fear, hate, and prejudice, seemed to just begin. Tamara was married a few years later and eventually gave birth to two children, one of whom is my mother, Hannah, and the second a son named Vladimir. In 1966, Janina, Pyotr, and Antonia Kodosevich were all honored at Yad Vashem as righteous among the nations for their remarkable bravery in hiding and protecting my grandmother. I will never, ever forget what happened to my grandmother and to the millions of Jewish people during the Shoah. Stories like my grandmother's and indeed of all my late grandparents and no doubt many of yours as well, is why keeping history alive is so important. We must create awareness of the dangers of prejudice, racism, and discrimination, as every individual can and should make a difference to not only Australia, but to our world. My grandmother was one of the lucky ones. She passed away peacefully in Latvia in 2011 when she was 82 years of age. Thank you for allowing me to tell her story, which keeps her memory and considerable spirits alive. There are 27,000 712 righteous among the nations from 51 countries around the globe. These people risked their life and liberty to help Jews during the Holocaust. Many were killed because of their bravery. Tonight, I light this candle in their honor. My name is Sean Torbett. I graduated from Emmanuel High School in 2018. I'm currently studying a double degree of psychology and cognitive and brain sciences at Macquarie University. I work part-time at Jewish Care as a mental health support worker, and I volunteer as much as I can for my Jewish community. 
I have a big, loving Russian family. Last year, before I turned 20, I started an initiative called Talking Holocaust, which encourages conversation and the Holocaust, specifically about it. I started this initiative because we must not forget the atrocities that happened to us. In creating Talking Holocaust, I thought of two very simple questions. One, what problems face our community? Two, what can we do to fix or reduce them? Through schools and the Sydney Jewish Museum, there's already a variety of Holocaust education programs. But what don't we have? Conversation. We're taught about the Holocaust at school. There's unlimited choice of books or movies. But what isn't there? I'll tell you. There isn't conversation, whether it's at home, with friends, with people who aren't even Jewish. There isn't conversation. My aim with Talking Holocaust is to provide a forum for people from the Russian Jewish community and the wider Jewish community to have the chance to speak with each other about theirs and their families' Holocaust experiences and stories. I was eight years old when I found out about the Holocaust. My grandparents showed me a wooden box. In the, in the box were photos of my great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents with their medals and honor in the Second World War. She told me stories of the time in war, some stories of the Holocaust. I became fascinated with my past. I was no longer a naive boy. I loved and respected my ancestors. I never knew. I pained my grandmother for more details every time I saw her. I memorized story after story. I even helped write timelines and family trees. When I was in year 10 at Emmanuel, we had to complete a project about writing an essay about Holocaust survivor, a way that our family was impacted by the Holocaust. I read about how my family saved 200 out of 800 of Yehuda Penn's paintings. My great-great-grandmother was a museum director before the, and during the war. However, in 1941, they had to escape. You may not know Yehuda Penn, but I guarantee you know Mark Chagall. Yehuda was his teacher. They took shelter in coal freight trains headed to St. Petersburg and then Saratov in Russia with these paintings for months, with four children and one baby in a metal basin, bombs being dropped on their heads, constantly having to run to the trees, the train being repaired as it was damaged. They stayed for three months in Saratov to hide the paintings and preserve them in the Saratov Historical Museum and then kept going before taking refuge in Tashkent. The rest of the 600 paintings cannot be found or were destroyed by the Nazi and USSR conflict. It's estimated that 50% of the population in Vitebsk, Belarus, were Jews. Those who didn't escape were put into death camps. 95% of the city was burnt down and demolished. This is only a small part of a single story that I've decided to share. And I'm sure there are many more memories that I haven't been told. Maybe they're too hard. Maybe there's no one left to remember them. Yet, I can say definitively, I do not know all my family's stories. But I promised myself I would do my best to listen to my grandparents and further so that one day I can tell my children and grandchildren about the stories too. After each Talking Holocaust event that we have hosted, receive messages, emails, and calls thanking us about providing an opportunity for people to share and listen. I've talked to students in high school, in university, about Talking Holocaust. In our generation, there's a major issue of identity, descendants of survivors that do not know the family's stories of suffering. The story is not only embedded in our memory, but it's also embedded in our genetics. By sharing these stories, we're able to learn and heal. As a community, we, not forget, we cannot forget how we continued, survived, and strived to endure the worst of experiences and memories. In the past Talking Holocaust events, we have had people of all ages sharing their family stories. For some, this is the only platform and time they have shared their story. We've had a lot of stories shared for the first time. We can only hope these will be further shared to the family following the confidence they gained. Thank you for letting me talk. Thank you for listening. I only hope to make a difference and that you do too. To end, I'd like to quote Rabbi Yitzhak Tenla. I do not speak to it because I have the power to speak. I speak because I do not have the power to remain silent.
This segment of the night is important to me as we are honouring Holocaust survivors who live in Australia, like my grandfather. Sulia Alexander Starikov, better known as Sasha, was born on the 5th of October in 1929 in Tamashpul, a small village located in the former USSR and present-day Ukraine. My grandfather was 12 years old when the Nazis seized his village and established the Tamashpol ghetto. Within days, the children were put to work with my grandfather being assigned to one of the Nazi commanders, as he could speak Yiddish and understand German. He could also sing Yiddish songs, which was advantageous both for him and his family, as he was paid in food for his entertainment. His talents, however, did not preclude him from the tyranny of the Nazis, and on several occasions, he was threatened at gunpoint. The Tamashpol ghetto was liberated by the Soviet army on the 16th of March in 1944. Sasha married my grandmother, Hannah, in 1954 after a single date lasting 24 hours. And as you can see, a few years ago, they celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary. And in 1979, they immigrated to Melbourne, Australia with their two children. Growing up, my grandfather taught me the same Yiddish songs from his childhood and he speaks openly about his past and constantly shares his experiences and invaluable life lessons, many of which are from his life during the Holocaust. Today, my grandfather is 91 years young, with three grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, and 80 years on, he still entertains us with his favourite Yiddish songs, both with his Holocaust Survivors Choir in Melbourne and for anyone that's around for a solo. Огромное спасибо нашим гостям, которые будут зажигать свечи сегодня. We will now light the memorial candles. Lighting the first candle is Yefim Lesnik. Yefim Chaim Lesnik was born in Leningrad, St. Petersburg, Soviet Union in 1929. Both his parents were from Minsk and family would always spend the summer holidays in Belarus. In June 1941, just before the German invasion of the Soviet Union, Yefim travelled to his grandmother's shtetl, Smilovichi, near Minsk, with his mother and his four-year-old brother, Alex. Due to connections his uncles in Minsk had in business, they got wind of the horrors to come and quickly packed and left Minsk on the morning of the 25th of June, 1941. By that time, the road to Moscow was under constant bombing by advancing German forces. The only way to get out was by walking 200 kilometres to the city of Mogilev. The road to Mogilev went through Smilovichi, and so the family stopped there for the night. Yefim's grandmother and mother did not want to walk to Mogilev, so they said goodbye to Yefim's cousin, uh, uncles in the morning. However, Yefim wanted to go with his uncles. This is what saved his life. In one month's time, his mother, brother, grandmother, and all of Similovici's Jews were taken to the Minsk ghetto and subsequently murdered. Together with his uncles, Yefim travelled to Kazan and further to the Ural Mountains where the whole family went to work in an ammunition factory. After the war, Yefim became a clockmaker like his father and uncle. He moved to Riga where he got married and raised family. He always thought of Australia as the best country in the world and was very happy when his daughter had an opportunity to emigrate to Australia. Yefim joined his daughter in Sydney in 1995. Yefim lights this candle in memory of his family and the Jewish people from Russia who were murdered in the Holocaust. Lighting the second candle this evening is David Binder. David was born in a small shtetl 100 kilometres from Riga in Latvia. When the Nazis invaded Latvia in 1941, his family had just recently celebrated his brother's bar mitzvah. An older sister was 11 years old, David was nine years old and he had a little sister who was three years old. His father knew a lot of people who worked in politics, so he knew that the Nazi invasion meant a certain death for the Jewish population. David's grandfather provided his father a horse and cart and they packed up their belongings with their neighbours and escaped through the forest and swamps, which his father knew well. The murder of Latvian Jews became immediately. David's mother and siblings got themselves onto a train that was headed to Central Asia. Their father stayed behind and joined the Red Army to fight the Nazis, and they had no food, clothes, or medicine, and people on the train were starting to get sick with typhus. Not long after they reached Central Asia, their mother and sister passed away from typhus, and David, together with his brother and sister, had to dig their graves for them. Soon after the death of their mother and sister, their father was killed in the war, so they were now left to fend for themselves. 
The following four years were the hardest for the children, but they stayed together and eventually survived. And when the war was over, they returned to their shtetl, but there was nothing left of it, nothing left of their home, and not one Jewish resident had survived. From that moment, they had to become adults. David has had a good life with his wife of 63 years, Dora, who is also a Holocaust survivor. However, unfortunately, due to her health condition, she is unable to join us here today. They have two children, four grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren who all live in Sydney. David is very happy that today his family is proud of their Judaism and interested in learning about his experiences during the war and in passing it down to their children. David lights his candle in memory of his family and the Jewish people from Latvia who were murdered in the Holocaust. Lighting the third candle is Francine Lazarus. Francine was born in 1938 in Ixelles, two years before the Nazis invaded Belgium. Belgium was invaded on 10th of May 1940. The roundup of Jews began in earnest in 1942. Francine was four when her father left her with strangers on a farm and had disappeared. Distraught, frightened and lonely, Francine cried for days. She was relatively safe and had enough food for some time. However, eventually the farms were caught by the Gestapo and Francine returned to Brussels. Walking with her father, hearing the heavy footsteps of the boots, they hid in a doorway with Francine wrapped in her father's big black coat. Francine moved from safe house to safe house. Her clothes became too small, her shoes too tight. She received clothes from the other children and passed hers on, although riddled with lice. Francine had to hide in a dark cupboard and remain incredibly still, despite the itch from the louse bites. Francine's father was caught and sent on the last convoy from Belgium on the 31st of July in 1944, and was subsequently murdered in Auschwitz. The only remaining tangible memory of her father is his ring that Francine still holds on to. After liberation, not able or willing to care for her, Francine's mother sent her to foster care. Her mother remarried in 1948 and gave birth to Francine's half-sister, whom Francine had to take care of at the age of 11. In 1959, Francine left Belgium, arriving in Sydney by ship. Francine describes the vista upon her arrival. Coming through the heads, I saw this beautiful place bathed in sunshine. I had found my harbour. Francine lights this candle in memory of her family and the Jewish people from Belgium who were murdered in the Holocaust. Lighting the fourth candle is George Sternfeld. George was born in 1939 in Warsaw. His family escaped to Bialystok soon after the war started. Due to his father's quick thinking by saying that he had engineering skills, and even though they were Jewish, the family was sent to Siberia to work where they survived the war. On return to Poland in 1946, they discovered that their home was in ruins, that they were the only survivors from a large family in Poland. They rebuilt their lives and stayed in Poland until George finished his schooling and they moved to Australia in 1960. George lights his candle in memory of his large family and the Jewish people from Poland who were murdered in the Holocaust. Lighting the fifth candle this evening is Maya Lipowiecki. Maya was 11 years old when the Nazis invaded her family hometown of Odessa, Ukraine. Her father and older brothers were sent to fight with the Red Army and her mother could tell that times would get dangerous for the Jewish people. Luckily, they were able to get on the last boat that was leaving Odessa. The second last boat that left the port was bombed by the German army and all the Jewish people fleeing on the boat were murdered instantly. None of the ports wanted to take the boat but they eventually disembarked in Tajikistan. Life was very difficult without food, proper shelter and constant fear of illness and death. When the war was over in 1945, Maya and her mother returned to Odessa. She remembers seeing gallows still on the streets with bodies hanging from them. Their apartment and all their belongings were taken over by the neighbours, so once her father and brother returned injured from fighting, they had to start their lives all over again. Maya married in 1948 and her family immigrated to Australia with the help of the Jewish Welfare Society. Today, Maya has four grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. 
Maya lights this candle in memory of her family and the Jewish people from Ukraine who were murdered in the Holocaust. Lighting the sixth candle is Sofia Paris. Sofia was born in 1936 in the small shtetl of Azarichi in the southern part of Belarus. In 1941, when German forces bombed her hometown, Sofia, then five years old, fled with her mother and two younger sisters whilst her father was fighting in the Red Army and later would go on to join the partisans. For the next three years, the four of them traveled by train deeper and deeper into Siberian Russia and as the German front advanced eastwards. Sophia scavenged for food in the forest and cared for her two younger sisters as her mother worked long hours, first on a farm and then in a factory. Eventually, Sophia started to accompany her mum to work, doing whatever she could to help, her, to help earn a little bit more money. In July 1944, after Belarus was liberated, Sophia's family got news that her father was alive and the family made their way back to their hometown to be, to be reunited. Sophia lights this candle in memory of her family and the Jewish people from Belarus who were murdered in the Holocaust. Please rise. Kedusha 
Iskadal vi iskadash mei rabo. Be alma di brachi lo sei, vi amlich malchus sei. Ve chaye chon uvi yom chon uvi chaye de chol be Yisrael. Ba agolov izman kori vimru amen. Yehei shmei rabo mevorach lo lam lel mei ol maya. Vis borach vis tabach vis boar vis roman vis nasei. Vis ador vis alevi salol shmei de kudusha brichu. Lei lamin kol brichasa v'shirasa tush brichasa v'nechem asa damiram be'alma v'imru amen. Yehei shlomar rabam min shmaya v'chayim tovim aleinu v'akol Yisrael v'imru amen. Hose shalom b'mramav hu yase shalom aleinu v'akol Yisrael v'imru amen. I close this commemoration by reciting a prayer which was composed specifically for Yom HaShoah by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who passed away just over 100 days ago. Today on Yom HaShoah, we remember the victims of the greatest crime of man against man, the young, the old, the innocent, the million and a half children, starved, shot, given lethal injections, gassed, burned, turned to ash, because they were deemed guilty of the crime of being different. We remember what happens when hate takes hold of the human heart and turns it to stone. What happens when victims cry for help and there is no one listening? What happens when humanity fails to recognize that those who are not in their image are nonetheless in God's image? We remember and pay tribute to the survivors who bore witness to what happened and to the victims so that, robbed of their lives, they would not be robbed also of their death. We remember and give thanks for the righteous among the nations who saved lives often at risk of their own, teaching us how, 
In the darkest night, we can light a candle of hope. Today on Yom HaShoah, we call on you, Almighty God, to help us hear your voice that says in every generation, do not murder. Do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. Do not oppress the stranger. We know that while we do not have the ability to change the past, we can change the future. We know that while we cannot bring the dead back to life, we can ensure that their memories live on, that their deaths were not in vain. And so on this Yom HaShoah, we commit ourselves to one simple act, Yizkor, remember. May the souls of the victims be bound in the bond of everlasting life. Amen. We conclude tonight with a partisan song, Advance Australia Fair in Hatikva. Please rise. Zognit came all as the gaze them lets them beg. Hotchim len blayen, fast elen blayet eg. Kumen vet nach unser reus gebengte scho. Svet apoikt on unser trot mir seinen do. Kumen vet nach unser reus gebengte scho. Sveta poikt on unser trot mir seinen do. Von grünen Palmenland bis weißen Land von Schnee. Wir kommen an mit unser Wein, mit unser Wein. Und wo gefallen sie, so spritzt von unser Blut. Spratzen wird dort unser Gwurre, unser Mut. Und wo gefallen sind, da spritzt von unser Blut. Spratzen wird dort unser Gwurre, unser Mut. So wird die Morgensonne bagilden uns dem Heint. Und der Nächten wird verschwinden mit dem Feind. Nur euch versammeln wird die Sonne in dem Kajor. Wie ja Parol soll gehen das Lied von dort zu dort. Nur euch versammeln wird die Sonne in dem Kajor. Wie ja Parol soll gehen das Lied von dort zu dort. Das Lied geschrieben ist mit Blut und nicht mit Blei. Es ist nicht kein Lied von Afoi geläuft der Frei. Nur so der Volk zwischen Fallen dicke Wind. Das Lied gesungen mit einer Gannes in die Hände. Nur so der Volk zwischen Fallen dicke Wind. Das Lied gesungen mit einer Gannes in die Hände. Da sag nit kei mal as du gehst dem letzten Weg. Chod schimlen blayen e fastellen blayet e. Kumen vet nach unser eus gebengte scho. Svet apoikt on unser trot mir seinen do. Kumen vet nach unser eus gebengte scho. Svet apoikt on unser trot. Mir ist ein Ende doch.